Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Mark's on this absolutely gorgeous fall day. I would also like to offer a greeting to those who are listening on radio and watching on television. Pastor? And good morning from me as well. Uh, I was here last week. For those of you who were here last week, my name is Gary Sandberg. I'm on staff at Trinity Lutheran Seminary here in Columbus. It's my pleasure to be with you for these couple of weeks. We continue in this season of Pentecost. It's a season of growth as we grow in our understanding of who God is for, for our lives and we grow in an understanding how we respond to God in that as well. As we've been going through these uh, summer months in the Gospel of Matthew, We've heard a few parables. Uh, it seems like every week another parable about the kingdom of heaven and we're back in that same way today. We're going to hear a little bit of a contrast in these parables, particularly from last week into this week. Uh, when, when we look at that transition, some real hopeful messages that come through the prophecy of Isaiah and of course Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, as we, we know it as Philippians. And all of that is a part of our, uh, a part of our worship together this morning. As we begin and prepare ourselves for worship, we come before God, knowing that God understands our human frailties and our failings. And so we take time to join in a confession of our sins, which then allows us to hear God's wonderful words of forgiveness. I invite you to stand as we join and prepare ourselves. We are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that, that we are captive to sin and, and cannot free ourselves. We, we have sinned against you in thought, thought word, and deed, by, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. undone. We, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We, we have, have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For, For the, the sake, sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Set the 
of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. This is the feast of victory for our God. people to, to come forward. If we have any who are brave enough, I saw a few back there. Are they brave enough to come this way? At least one of them is. All right. We'll take one brave soul if we can. Oh, there's another one. Hey, all right. Yeah, boy, look at that. A stand, uh, an ovation for just coming into church. Look at that. And I'm going to have you join me right here. We're not going to go up and sit down. You can just come right here with me today. We'll see you. And if they stay right there, they can participate. All right, as they come this way, you have an important job this morning because you have to start a response for the whole church. Okay, now we're going to read some things in scripture today, and some of them aren't going to sound real great. In fact, they're going to sound really challenging, but we know that God wants us to live in very exciting ways, and in fact, in joyful ways. 
So a couple of times, I'm going to say, kids, are you ready? And I'm going to say something like, it won't come out just like this, but it'll be something like, how are we supposed to live? Or what are we supposed to do? And you have a very important word, and you're going to hear it in just a minute when we have our second lesson read. When Paul writes to the church at Philippi, he's going to say this, rejoice. Again, I say to you, rejoice. All right? So when I say, what are we supposed to do? You're going to say what? Rejoice. Yeah, but you got to shout it out and fill the church up with it. And then after you say rejoice, I'm going to say again, and you're going to say rejoice. Right. So let's try this. Right. So I'll say, what are we supposed to do? Rejoice. Again. Rejoice. Okay, now, if you say it real loud, what will probably happen is some people out there will get so excited they won't be able to contain themselves and they'll join you in saying that, all right? That's really possible. But see, here's the key. This is how God wants us to live. All of the time that we hear these challenging messages, and I'm going to talk to him about some today, that sound as if we're never going to be able to be good enough for God, what God keeps saying to, to us is, just keep working at it. This is why we come to church. This is why we pray. This is why we sing praises because we keep becoming more of who God wants us to be. And when life gets challenging, we have to remember that God wants the best for us. And when we know that, how are we supposed to, or, or, or how are we supposed to act? What are we supposed to do? Rejoice. Again. Rejoice. All right, guys, so now you be ready, all right? Because when I call it out, I'm going to let you know when it's coming. It could get a little while into the sermon if I get too excited talking about other things. But when I get there, I'm going to call you out and see if we can do that. Remember, that's how God wants us to live. Thanks for coming up and for helping me out later. Be listening and we'll get to it. All right, you can go back to your seats now. Thanks. A reading from Isaiah. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, a fortified city, a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from a rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When a blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with a shade of clouds, the song of the ruthless was stifled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord.
My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Iodia and I urge Syncrity to be the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. And those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? and he was speechless. Then the king said to his attendants, 
bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. So has anybody here had an opportunity to plan a wedding at some point in your life? Either yours or a sons or daughters and all of that that goes with that. So this parable should resonate pretty closely with you. You understand how all of that works, how, uh, you know, you invite people and they don't show up. So at the last minute, you're just opening the doors and dragging anybody you can in for, you know, for that wedding banquet, how, how that works. And then you understand that process then pretty well. But you probably do understand the process of sending out invitations and some people just don't respond. You know, and you're thinking, okay, we had a date of September 1st. We were supposed to have all these returned, and now it's the 8th, and now do I make phone calls and find out if people are coming and hear their excuses for not coming? What do I do with all of this? Well, in this parable, that's the the dilemma, it seems, that the king has. And the people are just, they're just busy. One's got a business to take care of. One's got a farm to take care of. So it seems like maybe there's legitimate excuses why they're not coming. And then the story goes on and it gets very troubling what happens now. This story seems very different in a way from last week's prophecy and parable that we had from Jesus. You remember the prophecy from Isaiah last week and the parable again that was recorded in Matthew. And both of those had the, uh, the same setting. Um, what were both of them talking about last week? They were both set where? In the vineyard. No, Fairdale, you were here at the first service. You, you, uh, you, you pulled that up. At the first service, everyone just looked at me with a blank stare on their face. Just so you know. Even Dale, I think, but I'm not sure. He might have been with me on that one. And I told him, well, I, you know, I, I didn't blame him because people told me last week, they said, oh, pastor, I'll remember that sermon for three days. Apparently they did because they didn't bring it with them again. But we both had that parable of the vineyard. And you remember in the prophecy from Isaiah, it was about the vineyard being destroyed, the walls being taken down and everything being wiped out. And even when we heard about the, Jesus and his parable talking about what's going to happen when, you know, when the overseer comes in is going to throw out all of those who didn't take care or who maltreated the prophets and the son who came afterward. It was so definitive in that parable. But so, it was so obvious to see that God was the landowner, that the original slaves that were sent were the prophets, and then the son came. And as we know, the story of Jesus so evident to line all that up. Not so in today's parable from Jesus. The beautiful thing about parables is they offer us so many entry points and really so many exit points for our own lives. And so for this parable today, we can understand that sometimes we've been the person who's received the invitation to the wedding. And we've looked at our calendar and said, oh, I just can't get there. You know, it's not going to be possible for me to do that. I'll bet we've also had the experience of getting an invitation to a wedding and saying, oh my gosh, what can I get on my calendar so I don't have to go to this? You know, what's a good excuse for me not having to attend? We know that entry point into this parable as the person who receives the invitation. We also probably know what it's like to be those people who, who, who do show up for the wedding, who maybe are invited at the last minute, who, who, who kind of come in because they realize, well, some people couldn't make it and, you know, couldn't you just come? And, and, and so we're okay with that sometimes. We sort of come in knowing we might not have been on the first list, but as tables opened up and they had more room, they sort of reached out to other friends and, and brought us into those situations. We probably also know that time where the invitation has gone out and the person has showed up, uh, uh, shown up for the wedding and been there, and we've all looked around and thought, couldn't they dress up even for this, you know? Does it really always have to be jeans and a t-shirt, even for a wedding? And we look at that and it just seems like some people are, are always the people who are inappropriately dressed. And maybe we even know when that's been us. You know, when the invitation's been come and it said casual, and you show up, and everyone else's invitation, it, it seems to have said dressy. So you're the only one there that seems like they're dressed casual and everyone's dressed up and you feel so out of place. This parable allows us to enter in 
an exit in so many places, but it gets very troubling. Because the people who, who were too busy to come at first, well, they maltreated the prophets who had been sent, the slaves who'd been sent to them, and that doesn't sound like us. And then the king burned down the city and, and murdered all of those people who were so wrong to the king for his son's wedding. And it seems like we're getting very troubled by this. But then the wedding comes and maybe we're okay because we're at the wedding and we can smooth all of this over. But then the king sees one person there without a wedding robe on. And we got to be thinking, well, how could everybody have a wedding robe on? These people were dragged in off the streets. And if we remember right, dragged in off the streets of a city that was just burned to the ground, you know? So if the city's been burned to the ground and destroyed, where in the world was everybody supposed to come up with a wedding gown all of a sudden? And we want to get real practical with this. Well, let's see now. Obviously, there are people who rent wedding gowns. Obviously, the king would have made provisions for everybody. And this person just chose not to put the wedding gown on. And we try to come up with all of these excuses for the person. But here's, this, here's the thing we have to remember. Jesus is not telling a historical story. This is a parable that allows us to enter in and, and to exit, allows us to find new meanings and old meanings for our lives. We don't have to figure out where all the things about whether a person could or could not have a wedding gown. Maybe what we need to think about is what if that was me? What if that was me? And I was found to be not wearing the appropriate clothes. Well, we know that clothing has some great metaphorical ways of talking about our lives in Scripture. We, we talk about putting on the robe of righteousness and the breastplate of faith and the sword and the shield as Paul kind of unveils that for us. We talk about putting on the garments of righteousness and all of that is there. What if this wedding is the wedding for the church as the bride of Christ. What if that's the wedding that we're talking about? Then we see all of ourselves as those guests, and we would have to know that there are times when I don't look like I'm wearing the wedding gown because this wedding is not a three-hour event on a Saturday night. This is the church being married to Jesus Christ, we as the bride of Christ, and that means that this gown is something we wear all the time that we represent Christ in all that we do. And you know, sometimes I don't look like I'm wearing that wedding gown. Sometimes I don't look the way I want to look when I'm in this place. And we know that people look at the church sometimes that way. And we'll know, what, what do people say? What's the number one reason people say, I don't want to go to church, it's just filled with hypocrites. Exactly. And our response ought to be, there's room for one more. Why not? <laughs> Come and join us. Because, you know, that's kind of just how life is sometimes. I don't always look like I'm wearing the wedding gown. I don't always look like I've just gotten married to Christ. But we get tossed out when we intentionally say, I'm not going to bother. I'm going to come here just to look good for an hour for all of you. But don't expect me to live my life that way. Sure, I'm going to come here and put on a good face. And then I'll go home and I'll cheat on my taxes and take deductions that I don't, that I don't deserve. And I'll, and I'll go online when everyone goes to sleep in my house. And I'll surf pornography. And that, and that neighbor of mine whose dog's always barking, I'm going to sneak out in the middle of the night and, and I'll let the air out of the tires of his car. Because that's what I really like to do. That's the way I want to live but I'll come here and put on a big face. And that's where Jesus would say, find him hand and foot and throw him out. If you want to be here and be real, be here and admit you're a sinner. Be here and admit that the church is open to one more sinner. We don't want people to say, I'm just too busy for church. I had too many things to go, going on in my life to think I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to sit in church with a bunch of hypocrites. Maybe if I admit I'm a hypocrite. I could come and join you. And so when the king said people wouldn't come, he went out and said, we'll take anybody who's willing to be real enough with their own life to say they can be in a place like this. And we'll open up the doors for sinners. Come and join us. If I ever walked into a church that was filled with people without sin, you know what they would say to me? Bind him hand and foot and throw him out. We don't need him here. It hasn't happened yet. Because I think secretly you all know 
We're sinners together in this, but we're not giving up because we are called to this banquet and we're called because God chooses to do something with us. Last week's prophecy from Isaiah talked about the vineyard being destroyed and wiped out because God would say there are things about our lives that need to be wiped out. There are attitudes that we have, there are actions that we take on that need to be destroyed. But what was Isaiah's prophet, prophecy about today? Oh, come back to the mountain. Come back to this mountain. The shroud that's cast is going to be lifted. The food that's there is going to be worthy of a banquet. It's going to be a feast. A feast of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine, strained clear. God doesn't deal just with destruction. God only deals with destruction when there's a chance for restoration. And that's why we come to a place like this. Because we understand there's things about our lives that need to be destroyed so that God can be the one who restores. Otherwise, we wouldn't start our service with the confession and forgiveness. We would start our service with the why we are so blessed to be the great people we are. I mean, wouldn't that be a great way to start church sometimes? That we don't need a confession and forgiveness, God. We're just going to start church with the why we are so great and that's because we're here, you know, statement. No. We start with the confession and forgiveness because we are real about ourselves and we're willing to put on that robe that says we know why we're married to Christ because Christ has the power to restore us Christ has the power to renew us and so that's why we are Christ's church that then allows us to hear these words from Paul I mean otherwise Paul's words would, would seem fake to us because they'd say, there's no way we can live up to that and even Paul says I know what it's like to, to, to want to live this way, but just think about how, what I've been doing. Think about gentleness. Think about justice. Think about peace. Think on all these things and try to make them real for your life. Now, kids, you've been waiting a long time, I know, but I'm getting ready for you. Where are you? Where's the, where's the kids who are up here for, this, for, the, for, the, for the time with me? Because we have all of these things going on, and we know that we are the, we're not the people that God always calls us to be, but we're trying to be, and in that, Paul says, because of that, our names can be written in the book of life. And right after Paul says, your names can, are going to be written in the book of life. How, kids, how does God want us to live? Rejoicing. rejoicing. Yes, who wants us to rejoice again? Rejoice. rejoice. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. And is it possible? It doesn't seem possible at first. It doesn't seem possible when we're invited to a banquet and we know in our heart of hearts that we could be the one bound hand and foot and thrown into the outer darkness. There doesn't seem like there's much rejoicing there. But that's not God's final word. God's final word is a word of redemption. It's a word of restoration and it's a word of life. Your names written in the book of life, how are we, what are we supposed to do? Rejoice again. Rejoice, that's our call. We can't just live on a parable that has one way for us to get in and out. <clears throat> we can't just be the invited guest who said, you know, sometimes I'm just too busy. That's not going to be us all the time. We can't also just be the guest who says, oh, I'm worthy. I'm in there and I'm, and I'm wearing the robe and I'm just fine. We'll never just be that guest. Sometimes we're going to be the guest that says, you don't look like you're living the way God asked you to live. You don't, look like, you don't look like you're the one who's taking care of the vineyard. You look like there are some things in your life that you know could change. And God has the power to do it. And if not, there would be nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth, but that's not what Paul says. Paul says there is a different way to live in Christ Jesus because your names are written in the book of life. What are you supposed to do? Rejoice. Again. Rejoice. That's our call. It only happens if you're willing to be real. Be real enough to know that I need confession because then you'll know forgiveness. Be real enough to know that you are the bride of Christ and with that comes tremendous responsibility. Be real enough to know that when you leave this 
place, somebody needs you to, to see you still wearing that wedding gown. Be real enough to know that sometimes you'll fail, but that'll never be the final word because God's going to call you to the mountain. God's going to call you to the banquet of rich food, of well-aged wine, strained clear, because our God is a God of restoration. What are we supposed to do? Rejoice. Again. Rejoice. Amen. Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In grateful response to God's endless bounty of grace, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, unite the wills of your people. Empower us to be of the same mind in the Lord, so that through word and deed we might give faithful witness to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Creator of valleys and green pastures, of small towns and urban centers, give, us, give your care to this world. Inspire in us, your creatures, a love for all you have made, and grant us wisdom to care for it. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of all people, establish your peace in the world. Give the leaders of the nation a desire for reconciliation and a yearning for justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Merciful God, lead all who are sick to the healing waters of your mercy. Bless the work of doctors, nurses, and caregivers, and through their efforts, restore the sick to health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, by your power, grant this congregation the faith to stand firm in Jesus Christ. Send your spirit to this place so that through all its ministries, your wisdom and truth might be made known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of blessed hope, comfort those who grieve with the promise of new life in Christ Jesus. Give us blessed assurance that you will swallow up death forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, holy God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that peace.
Together we pray. Merciful, Merciful God, God as, as grains of wheat scattered upon, upon the hills were, were gathered, gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We are gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, and so we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, you that are blessed by God, come to the banquet.
invite you to stand. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now may the love of God fill up your hearts. May the joy of Christ fill up your souls. And may the Spirit of God send you forth rejoicing because you are blessed in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
grace of God. Teach the word of God. Serve the people of God so that all may come to believe. Yeah, open the invitation at any time if you want to come back. Uh, can't hear me back there? No. All right, I'll speak louder then. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Gary, with the last two weeks, we really enjoy having you here, so I'd like to say thank you very much. The next thing I have to say is last Wednesday night, Rejoice! <laughs> Again, rejoice! rejoice.